Welcome to NACTV Reads the News. My name is Kathy McGrath and I'm one of many volunteers that help create programming for our station. NACTV can be seen on MTS Channel 30 or 1030, Westman Cable Channel 17, Bell Satellite Channel 592, or online at nactv.tv. These programs are made possible by our volunteers, staff, advertisers, as well as donations made by you, the viewers. If you are enjoying your NACTV experience, please consider supporting us by either donation or volunteering. You can contact our office at 204-476-2639 or at nactv at wcgwave.ca. <coughs> And today's issue of the Nipua Banner and Press is for Friday, June 21st, 2024, our first full day of summer. And on the front, Nipuan area 2SLGBTQ plus community members and allies were painting with pride at Arts Forward on June 16th by Casper Warren. A new colorful addition to the town of Nipua was made this past Sunday. On that day, sleeves were rolled up and brushes at the ready to paint with pride alongside the recently formed Nipua and Area Pride Group. The painting project was the creation of a permanent rainbow sidewalk located just out front of Arts Forward. The intention of the installation is to create visibility for and to celebrate the 2SL GBTQ 1A plus individuals that call Nipua and the surrounding area home. Rianne Beaver, president of Nipuan Area Pride, provided some background on the group as well as some opening comments for the day. We officially formed our board a few weeks ago but started to do different endeavors starting at the beginning of this year. We did an event in January where we had a lovely turnout at the library and then have done a few games nights since, said Beaver. Beaver added, basically, we're providing a safe space for anybody in the community to come out and be who they are and be with people who feel comfortable around. It's open to the 2SLGBTQ plus community, but also to our allies, our friends and family, which are so important in helping us to create that safe space that we all need, that we know is here, but we also need to feel and to see. Paint with pride, Beaver noted, is all a part of creating that safe space and making the 2SLGBTQ plus community in Nipua and area visible. We are here, we have always been here, and we always will be, said Beaver. I've had people ask me, why do you want to stay in the rural areas when you could go to the city? But we're not meant to hide, we're not meant to not be who we are. Beaver added, we have families, we have lives, we have jobs. We're incredibly important to this community. We stand beside our neighbours and we do exactly the same thing as they do day in and day out. And that's why it's important we put our stamp on this community so that kids who are like us and are growing up beside us know that they are safe and can be exactly who they want to be and who they are. For the project itself, a section of the sidewalk was primed and then divided into segments to accommodate each of the colours that were to be used. All were welcome to help paint the sidewalk, whether they be part of the 2SL GBTQ plus community, allies, friends, or family. The flag painted by the activities participants utilized the color scheme of what is known as the Progress Pride flag. This particular flag was designed by an individual named Daniel Quasar in 2018. It uses the colors of the rainbow flag, which celebrates the community as a whole while also incorporating the trans, transgender, pride flag and the black and brown stripes from the design adopted by the City of Philadelphia, USA in 2017. The blending of these elements by Quasar was to bring for further focus to the inclusion and progress within the 2SL GBTQ plus community for transgender individuals and the LGBTQ plus people of color. For Nipuan area pride sidewalk project, the colors from this flag were touched up later the same evening to straighten any lines, as well as to add a white border stripe. The white stripe is functional, serving a purpose some may not be aware of. We have to make sure that the sidewalk meets with the age-friendly initiative, Beaver explained. 
The white border denotes that it is a sidewalk so that it is not confusing to someone with dementia or Alzheimer's. Gratitude was extended to sponsors Pyramid Collision, Home Hardware and Arts Forward and all those who came out to participate and pictured as part of the work crew and the finished project. So, moving on. <coughs> Sober and social in Nipua. All ages alcohol free event raises funds for mental wellness program by Owen Devereaux. It was hangouts over hangovers at Nipua's second annual all ages sober social on Friday, June 7th. The evening, which was held at the Royal Canadian Legion branch number 23, featured a mix of mocktails, a variety of live music, as well as other alcohol free entertainment options. Jeff Descender, owner and operator of Frozen Fire Studio, helped organize the social and said that everyone involved is pleased with how it all came together. He added this year's social saw a lot more people, including more from outside of the community, taking part in the festivities. We had people from Winnipeg, Shiloh, Carberry and Brandon, just from all over the place, who came to Nipua and had a good time. It ranged from people who have family here to those who have never been here before. It was a wide variety of people getting together and networking, said Descender. The social leaves all that alcohol and that type of negative stuff that can follow behind. So it was just you and your realist form having a good time. Descender noted that the variety of musical performance performers booked for the night said to him that they also enjoyed the overall experience. The performers just had a blast. We talked ahead of time and it's like, we're not even going to treat this like a gig, we're just here to have fun. And they did. Descender stated, we just had a great time laughing and joking on stage, laughing and joking with the crowd, and all the musicians were doing that. And I think that changes the dyna dynamic of an event like that. The musicians enjoy being there and the crowd senses that, and then they get involved as well. A fundraiser for mental wellness. To go along with the fun and festivities, the Sober Social was also a fundraiser for Westman Mental Wellness and Suicide Prevention. Descender said that they were able to raise $1,025 for the organization. He added they had modest expectations of achieving similar, if not slightly better results than last year's 625, which was raised for miles for mental health. But after they added up the numbers from the night, Descender expressed that they were surprised and thrilled to see just how much was brought in for this year's worthy cause. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Advocate of the Year Award. For the first time this year, there was also the presentation of the Mental Health Advocate of the Year Award. This recognition was created to honor someone who doesn't work in mental health, but volunteers their time to helping others with their mental well-being. For 2024, Brenda Morris was named the inaugural Mental Health Ambassador of the Year. <coughs> Pre preserving stories for the future, Beautiful Plains Museum opens fire truck garage and exhibit. And pictured, the fire truck seen above is one of the variety of items now kept inside the Beautiful Plains Museum's fire truck garage, seen in the background, and the firefighting exhibit, which officially opened on June 12th by Casper Warren. Clear skies and sunshine graced the opening of the beautiful Plains Museum's fire truck garage on Friday, June 14th. The ceremonies took place at the museum grounds in front of the new garage at 11.30 a.m. All were welcome to enjoy a hot dog lunch, music, and tour the fire truck garage and museum. This project has taken several years to plan and implement, said Drysdale. The exhibit includes the mat man-drawn Franklin fire wagon from 1905, a variety of old firefighting equipment, photos from the area related to firefighting, and a fire truck which had previously been believed to be from 1942. Drysdale noted that information was received the day prior to the opening celebrations. The information, if correct, would mean that it was used in Brandon prior to being used at NEPWA's air training program in 1942. Nipua's own fire department began in 1884. At this time, things were quite different. For example, quite a large number of buckets were kept in stock and would have been filled via one of the multiple wells that were once found throughout the town. This exhibit preserves these stories for the future, said Drysdale. Agassi constituency MLA Jody Byram also provided comment during the opening day festivities. 
I'm honored to be here today with the community to celebrate the opening of the new home of the fire truck. It's important that we pay homage to the bravery and history associated with those who have served in the firefighting profession, said Byram. Adding later, this occasion is not just a celebration of the past, but a recognition of how far we have come. To see the exhibit for yourself, visit the beautiful Plains Museum at 91 Hamilton Street in Nipua. And pictured here below, a portion of the wall within the fire truck garage features a selection of photos relating to firefighting within the beautiful Plains area. These include pictures of old fire halls, firefighting crews, and more. And looking back, 1974, Nipawa Junior Rifle Club presents Rifle to Sangster, and that is pictured here on the right. Don Sangster, left, was presented the top honour at the Nipawa Junior Rifle Club's 1974 edition of its marksmanship event in June of that year. The rifle was donated and presented by Nelson Shoemaker, right, with it being the 15th rifle he has provided to the club. Don Don being the second member of the Stank Sangster family to win the coveted award. His sister Kathy won it in 1971. So, by Casper Warren, looking back. 125 years ago, 1899. A woman wants a man for a husband, one with a life energy, courage. Girls, if you can get one without these good qualities, give him Rocky Mountain tea. T'will do the business. Ask your druggist. Ooh. 100 years ago, 1924. The 20th anniversary of the Inkerman congregation held Sunday and Monday was largely intended. Nipawa Board of Trade has joined with Winnipeg and many other Western Canada centres in protesting to Parliament against further suspension of the Crow's Nest Pass Railway Weights Agreement. The Minister of Railways and our representative at Ottawa have been advised. The Nipawa Creamery and Produce Company are offering prizes for an amateur cream grading contest to be held at the Nipawa Fair Friday, July 4th at 4 p.m. Open to farmers and farmers' wives only. Not less than 10 entries or more than 30 entries will be carefully handled by two official cream graders. The Gladstone Age tells us of the splendid success of a native boy in the domain of Uncle Sam. William J. Cameron started as a student of pharmacy and developed into a traveling salesman for druggist supplies. This brought him into touch with the physicians and dentists and experimentation with their equipment. Eventually, he patented and engaged in the manufacture of materials for which a great demand sprung up and he is now employing more than a hundred persons. The youngest man mentioned is a nephew of Chaz Cameron of Nipua and of Mrs. Jo Jonathan Mason, formerly of this town. 75 years ago, 1949. Brookdale, Mr. and Mrs. S.J. Abbott are celebrating their 25th wedding anniversary on June 12th and will be at home to their friends from 3 to 5 p.m. For over 10 years, Eden has had a top-ranking ball club, which is also a strong competitor. Eden plays here Monday, June 20th at 6.30. 50 years ago, 1974, the Nipawa Press was awarded first in the competition for Best Christmas Edition at the annual convention of the Manitoba Community Newspapers Association, held in Brandon Thursday and Friday of last week. Second place went to the Carmen Dufferin Leader and third to the Steinbeck Carolyn News. The Shield has previously gone to the Carolyn News for the past five consecutive years. The Press also won second place for Best Editorial Page and third place for Best All-Around Community Newspaper in Manitoba with circulation over 1,500 subscribers. Nipawa residents were treated on Sunday afternoon to a preview of, of the Mast Band, which will perform at the Red River Exhibition Parade next Sunday, <coughs> June 23rd in Winnipeg. The band, under the direction of Ted Good of Brandon, is made up of members of the Nipawa, Hamiota, Carberry and Glenborough bands with over 100 musicians involved. Although the local institute program at McCurry is still to continue till June 28th, a portion of it, dealing with senior citizens, was brought to a successful conclusion. Two ladies who were instrumental in setting up the program were Mrs. L. F. Canton and Mrs. D. Gamache. Twenty years ago, 2004, the Manitoba Cattle Producers Association is calling for the establishment of a cattle plant that would test all cattle for mad cow disease. 
and a little ad in the lower left hand corner the Arden Lansdale Centennial Park Spring Carnival from 1974. The advertisement was placed in the June 20th edition of the Nipua Press for that year. Yeah, let's see what's coming up. Ah. The editorial, right in the center by Ken Waddell. The views expressed in this column are the writer's personal views and are not to be taken as being the view of the banner and press staff. I have often spoken and written along the following lines. In life, we need the four F words, faith, family, friends, and finances. And we need to keep them in that order. I learned long ago the need for faith, it's essential. My mother and father and two older brothers taught me the importance of family. When I joined into my wife Christine's family, the Lobels at Verdun, my appreciation of family grew deeper. Over the years, Christine and I have gathered literally hundreds of friends over our 70 plus years of living, 55 of which have been together. We value all our friends. As far as finances go, we farmed through the high interest crisis in the 80s. When we bought our farm, the neighbors said we would never pay for it, and they were right. Ironically, the price we paid for that half section farm in 1974 would buy you less than 10 acres today. Finances can be pretty shifty, and that's why it ranks in fourth place on my list. In 1979, we decided I would give up my job as ag rep with Manitoba Agriculture and go full-time farming and part-time auctioneering. The auction business lasted longer than the farm and transi transitioned us into the newspaper business. I am proud to say today that we have been involved in publishing in one form or another for 58 years. We started full-time in the newspaper business in 1981 nine with the birth of the Nipua Banner, a free distribution paper. We started the Rivers Banner shortly afterwards by buying up the assets of the closed down Rivers Gazette Reporter, which was a much earlier amalgamation, amalgamation of the Rivers Gazette and the Rapid City Reporter. Our grandson, Micah Waddell, now owns the Rivers Banner and we have a management arrangement with him to operate it. The Rivers Banner is a free distribution newspaper. In 2015, we bought the Nipua Press from Glacier Media of Vancouver. Hence today, the paper is the Nipua Banner and Press. So nine, now, nine years later, our path in Glacier Media's path crosses once again. We are pleased to announce that we have purchased our third paper, the Verdon Empire Advance from Glacier. It too will now be a free distribution newspaper. We are having a great amount of joy working on growing and expanding the Empire Advance. Even after all these years and with fewer visits than we wanted to Verdun, it's surprising how many people know Christine and her family. Both Christine and I have also been pretty much out there in political and social activities, and I guess a few people have noticed over the years. I believe that we will continue to grow all three papers by way of a tried and true formula. A newspaper can be likened to a four-legged milking stool. For those of you who are too young to remember what a milk stool is, if it's missing a leg, it tends to fall over and you end up in the gutter behind the cow. A community newspaper has to have four legs. Local news, editorials, ads, and oh yes, paper. Some may question why it needs paper. After all, in this day and age, everything is available online, isn't it? Well, yes. But news printed on paper provides a much higher level of reliability and accountability. When it's printed on a page, it stays written. In the internet world, just about anything goes. You can't tell truth from fiction, and what's presented one minute can be changed the next minute. Like they say about contracts, you got to get it in writing. Community newspapers get everything in writing. So, as the title of this column says, and then there were three. As a family, we are proud to now be serving three community newspapers and look forward to doing so in the future. And Home Buddies by Rita Friesen. A thoughtful evening. I, it was a thoughtful evening. It was also a thought-provoking. The textbook Poetic Experience, an anthology of poems for senior students, published in 1955, isn't that a lifetime ago? Was hauled off the bookshelf to review one poem in particular. Like looking something up on the internet, I descended down the rabbit hole. The much-worn and well-loved textbook was the one I studied in grade 12. 
This textbook was the one my father used while teaching in the Midland School Division, now a part of the Prairie Rose Division. So it could have been in Roland or in Starbuck that his hand held the book and the faded underlining and notations are difficult to decipher as they would have been when he wrote them. One of the things that struck me was how many portions of the Bible were recognized as poetry and worthy of memorizing and understanding. Psalm 23, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3, the Magnificat Luke 1, 46, 55, the one from the book of Ecclesiastes 12, 1 to 7, entitled, Remember Now Thy Creator. Dad underlined, Because man goeth to his long home, and noted the examples silver cold, cord, golden bowl, picture, wheel, are all symbols of life. The passage concludes with, Then shall the dust return to the earth it was, and spirit shall return unto God who gave it. I have to wonder if studying these words could be more life-enhancing and encouraging than being required to read The Handmaid's Tale. The textbook is divided into sections. British poets, American poets, Canadian poets, with a final section consisting of portions of longer works of poetry, like The Rime of the Ancient Mariner and a part of the Canterbury Tales. Dad made notes besides, beside Canada Case History, written by Earl Burney, and the summation states, the poet here throws out a challenge to Canada to grow up, to be a man, to assert independence in thought and act. I get that when I see the lines. This is the case of a high school land, dead adolescence, loud treble laughs and sudden fists, bright cheeks, the gangling presence. The boy, this boy is wonderful at sports and physically quite healthy. He's taken to church on Sunday still and keeps his prudence stealthy. He doesn't like books except about bears, collects new coins and model planes, and never refuses a dare. Reading that carefully, I see how much has changed already. And here the notation is a simple word, personal, yup. Human emotion captured by a poet's words can be freeing, encouraging, and challenging. John Macefield, Sea Fever, I must go down to the sea again, to the lonely sea in the sky, confirms that this longing for a place, a scene, a scent, is natural. Canadian poet Bliss Carmen in Vestigia, Footprints, speaks of finding peace and God in nature. There were no notes beside that one, and if Dad had taught on it, he would not have needed any notes, just sharing from his heart. There were passages I don't remember reading that caused me to pause. There were passages that brought me right back to the classroom. A lovely way to use an hour. And Faithfully Yours by Neil Strohshine. God cares, and so should we. It was a chilly day in early fall, 55 years ago. I was tilling a field on our family's farm using our farm tractor, an old style 930, no color case with no cab, pulling a 14 foot chisel plow followed by a 14 foot wooden drawbar to which were attached five diamond harrows. It wasn't an up to date system, but it was all we could afford at the time, and it worked for us. On this day, I was being followed by 50 to 100 seagulls. The black-headed birds flew right behind the harrows in an attitude of roughly over four feet. They scanned the tilled soil looking for bugs or worms to eat. When they found one, they stalled in midair, dropped to the ground, grabbed their meal and took off, all in less than 15 seconds. They were often joined by larger gulls with white heads. These gulls were after a larger quarry field mice. They would catch two or three, then fly off and sit on a fence post surveying their domain while their meal digested. They came, they ate until they were full, and then they left. They never ate too much, but they never went away hungry. Two things impressed me about these birds. First was their incredible talent. Our land speed was five miles per hour. The birds looked from side to side as they flew, scanning a strip of land roughly 10 feet wide. They rarely missed a potential meal. I was also impressed by the reaction if another bird got into their meal ahead of them. There were no angry outbursts, no fights over territory, no retaliatory attacks. They never cried over lost morsels. They just took off and resumed their search. This experience was repeated many times that year. Looking back on it now, I don't ever recall seeing any signs of worry on the faces of those birds. Not that I would know what a worried seagull looks like. They had no reason to worry. They knew that their creator had put more than enough food in that field to feed all of them. The farmer, in this case me, was making it easier to find. They just had to go out and collect it. 
but they also had to share what they found. Remember one occasion when a bird caught something that was too large to be swallowed in one gulp, so it tried to carry its potential meal to a safe place where it could be ripped into smaller portions and eaten one at a time. <coughs> no such luck. Other birds came by and they started fighting in mid-air over what the first bird had caught, but they dropped it when the catch got away. In his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus reminds us that the love and care God shows for the earth, its plants and its animals, extends to us as well. God has promised to give us the food, clothing and shelter we need, just like he did it for the birds who followed me while I was tilling our farm fields many years ago. He cares so much for us that he will give us more than we need. Do we care enough to share a portion of what we don't need today with someone who has nothing? Do we trust God to repay us for what we've done? That needy person who may cross your path today is a person for whom God cares. Maybe it's time we started caring for others as God cares for us. And BP Museum History, Skiing at the Valley. So pictured here on the lower right side. Did you know that the location near Nipua, known as Big Valley, once included a ski hill? This was known as Shangri-La and was created after some enterprising Nipua folks decided in 1938 that a ski hill should be constructed there. It became Manitoba's hottest new ski destination. It was shuttered for the duration of World War II with plans to return operation once the conflict ended. However, it never reopened. <clears throat> Letters. We wait, but don't hold our breath. Last August, I wrote to the banner about the unsafe conditions of the Carberry number one and number five intersection. This is how I ended my submission. The best we get is vague promises and dismissive correspondence about studying the situation. Isn't it MDTI's mandate to make out our roads as safe as possible? Wouldn't it be nice if they showed the expedient concern that those life and death issues deserve? I wonder if they will get rid of the piano that is dragging them down and stop lamely citing regulations since another serious accident has happened at highways 5 and 1 on Monday, July 31st. Don't hold your breath. I didn't hold my breath, but that doesn't diminish mine and countless others' frustration. Like many local residents, I avoid that intersection whenever I can. Also, like many local residents, I could detail a few of my own unsafe and nerve-wracking crossings in the past year. Whenever I am travelling at the posted 100 km hour on Trans-Canada to the east or west in this intersection, I always get passed by vehicles exceeding the speed limit. I realize infrastructure repairs and improvements are planned in advance, but I see some improvements or repairs that could be bumped and suspended in favour of more critical work. Had our government used some clout and demanded lights at this intersection immediately, it would be done by now. So, as we reflect and many grieve about the fallout of the worst highway accident in Manitoba, we wait but don't hold our breath for expedient action. Very sad and frustrating. The piano is still firmly attached. And that's from Rob Bjornsson of Carberry. And thumbs up, thumbs down. Thumbs up. Thank you to the town of Nipua for the wonderful job of telling the community garden. Greatly appreciated from the Nipua Community Gardeners. Out of Helen's Kitchen. Today's feature is pork ribs and she has recipes for barbecue ribs and spicy spare ribs. But her information includes spare ribs or baby back ribs. What's the difference? Baby back ribs are small rib ribs cut from the section of the pork where the ribs meet the backbone. Upper rib cage? They have the steeper curve and are leaner, tenderer and cost more than spare ribs. Spare ribs are the lower end of the baby back ribs, the lower rib cage. They contain more meat between the bones, but less on top. They are perfect for a low and slow cooking method due to the excess fat in this area. If the butcher has not removed the membrane, the silver skin, on the underside of the ribs, remove it. Go to one end of the rib rack, using a butter knife, slide it under the membrane and pull. Start at the narrow end of the ribs and slide the knife under the membrane and it will start to lift up. Work the knife around in order to get enough of the membrane up so that you can grip it. Then gently peel the main membrane back off the slab of ribs and discard. <coughs> and the Nipua RCMP are searching for two missing teens. 
On June 18th, 2024, at approximately 6.15 p.m., Nipua RCMP were notified of two missing teens. 14-year-old Henry Galt is described as 6 feet tall and 180 pounds, with long hair and a ponytail. He was last seen wearing a black hoodie with white art on the front and sleeves, back, black sweatpants, tan Timberland boots, and a navy black baseball cap. 16-year-old Dennis Martin is described as 5 feet tall and petite, with mid-length reddish hair. She was last seen wearing a black zip-up hoodie with a grey hoodie and flannel pajama pants. Officers believe that they may be in the town of Minidosa or surrounding area. If you have information on their whereabouts, please call Nipua RCMP at 204-476-7338, Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477, or online at www.manitobacrimestoppers.com. And the Agassiz MLA Spring Report by Jody Byram. The spring sitting of the legislature has wrapped up after three months of debate over numerous bills affecting people across the province, and I am proud of what my colleagues and I in the official opposition have achieved for Manitobans. Holding the government to be accountable to all Manitobans in my role as progressive conservative critic for Labour, I have worked with the other MLAs within the PC caucus to delay several pieces of NDP legislation that would damage business labour relations. One of those NDP DP bills we have delayed would repeal the previous PC government's fair and balanced law that currently allows non-unionized companies to bid on government construction projects. The NDP bill would do away with fairness and balance in the awarding of government construction work only to union contractors and potentially delay important construction and road works. This and other new NDP bills are designed to tilt the balance toward organized labor. For example, one piece of legislation would eliminate mandatory secret ballot voting for the union certification after the previous PC government reinstated such secret ballots for fairness and democracy. If adopted, the new legislation would open the door to pressure and intimidation during the certification process and make it difficult for employers to use replacement workers during work stoppages. More concerning, the latter bill is included within wider budget legislation, preventing Manitobans from having a say on those proposed changes to a legislative committee. This is not democratic and it is not right for our province. In my role as PC critic for immigration as well, I am pleased to have brought public attention to other matters. One such issue involved Manitobans who had just expressed justifiable concerns about problematic changes to the province's immigrant nominee program. After our PC team raised questions in the House and held the government accountable, only then did we see actions on the issues. While holding the government to account, our PC caucus is proud to have passed three of our own bills for Manitobans. One of these bills designates Tyndallstone as the provincial stone of Manitoba based on the significant role it has played in our province's history. Another PC bill will establish specialty Manitoba Parks license plates to support endowment funds that ensure the beauty and ecological in integrity of our 93 provincial parks. The third of these bills marks April 26 as Community Foundation Day every year, recognizing the numerous foundations that make meaningful and lasting contributions throughout our province, as well as their volunteers and donors. With summer upon us here in Manitoba, I look forward to attending Agassiz communities and participating in many fairs and celebrations. And Canada Day is coming up. Minidosa events. Nipua certainly won't be the only community hustling and bustling on Canada Day. Just down the road at Minidosa, a jam-packed schedule of activities have been planned. A pancake breakfast will kickstart the morning on June 1st from 8 to 11 at the Man Minidosa United Church. Some early activities such as Zumba and Sandcastle building will begin at 10 a.m. at the Minidosa Beach. Activities also taking place at the beach later in the day include a scavenger hunt, beach volleyball, rock painting, hay rides, face painting, and cornhole. All of these activities and much more. A full list of events and the times at which they are scheduled can be found on Minidosa Parks and Recreation Services social media and the Town of Minidosa web website under Parks and Recreations. <coughs> And Nipawa preparing for Canada Day celebration. 
by Owen Devereaux. Fireworks and an array of family-oriented fun will likely be the highlights of NEPWA's 2024 Canada Day festivities. Nicole Cooper, NEPWA's Director of Recreation Services, has told the Banner and Press that the town is putting together a day that they hope will be something special. This year, we will have live music throughout the entire evening with two local bands playing, Lunch Money and Five Star Double, I, Double One Avenue. We will also have the usual crowd pleasers like the horse-drawn wagon rides and children's inflatables and activities. Habitat for Humanity Nipawa chapter will also be doing a barbecue to raise funds for their projects in Cooper. The live music and horse-drawn wagon rides will both start at 5 p.m. at the Flats, where all the Canada festivities will take place. Cooper said the local location had to be shifted from Riverbend Park due to safety concerns relating to the setting off of fireworks and their proximity to the campground and localized tree growth. The visual display, however, is still expected to be an impressive one. While the majority of the events will begin at 5 p.m., there are still a few fun-filled activities earlier in the day. They include a public swim at 1 p.m., a town-wide scavenger hunt set for 2 p.m., and the duck dive at the swimming pool for 3 p.m. As for community volunteers to assist during the Canada Day, Cooper noted that they could still use a few more people to help with the festivities. She said she's hopeful people can donate an hour or two of their time to help make July 1st a success. Anyone who would like to help can contact the town office at 476-7600 for further details. <coughs> Open house held at Nipua construction site here on the upper left hand side. While we've all been looking at the progress from afar, some residents of Nipua recently took advantage of the chance for an ICA, ICE panel look and learn event at the Best Western Plus Hotel. The event was on June 14th from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. and was an opportunity to tour a four story ICE panel energy efficient building product. Plans are still in place for a late winter, early spring opening of the new hotel in 2025. <coughs> and Stride Credit Union donate to Beautiful Plains Ag Society. Representatives with the Beautiful Plains Ag Society as well as Stride Credit Union gathered at Nipwa Ag Grounds on Wednesday, June 12th for the check presentation of $25,000 to assist with upgrades to the complex by Owen Devereaux. Stride Credit Union was in a very giving mood recently in Nipua, and the Beautiful Plains Ag Society was the fortune, fortunate benefactor of that generosity. Representatives with the financial institution presented a check for $25,000 on Wednesday, June 12th, to assist with the installation of new signage as well as other upgrades at the Ag Complex. Terry Roulette, the VP of Brand and Marketing for Stride, was on hand in Nipua to present the funding support. She told the Banner and Press that the credit union believes in being a strong supporter of all of the communities they serve, especially in ones such as Nipawa, where agriculture remains an important fixture. We have a solid membership base in Nipawa, so it only made sense to add our support to the beautiful plain ag complex, said Roulette. It's also part of leaving a legacy behind. Ag is the backbone of our communities, and when we can support the community by investing in that structure that houses events and honours that tradition, we're all for it. Cam Tibbet accepted the donation on behalf of the Ag Complex and Exhibition Grounds. <coughs> he explained to the banner and press just where these funds will be distributed. Part of it will go towards the general operations and facility costs. But we're also looking at the barn and a large electrical upgrade. It's important to maintain that type of infrastructure for a building like this, said Tibbet. Stride has been very good at supporting the local communities, so it is very good to see them step up like this. As part of the funding support, Stride Credit Union will get naming rights at the complex, and some new signage should be installed in the near future. <coughs> and below, Gladstone Legion donates to Central Plains Cancer Services. The Gladstone Legion Branch 110 recently donated $1,500 to the Central Plains Cancer Services. From left to right, Provincial President Ernie Tester, Sherilyn Knox, Central Plains Cancer Services Chair, and Sylvia Haywood, President of the Gladstone Branch 110. <coughs> Excuse me. Filipino Independence Day Parade held in Nipawa, and pictured here on the upper right, Nipawa's Filipino community gathered together en masse on Saturday, June 15th 
to celebrate the culture and heritage of the nation, as well as Philippines Independence Day, which is recognized annually on June 12th. The festivities kicked off with a parade showcasing many of the different regions and cultures from within the Philippines. The event shifted to the Yellowhead Center in the evening for an array of food, dance, and other celebratory events. And a massive storm causes massive tree damage in Nipawa. So pictured here on the left, a huge thunderstorm system, which included winds of up to 100 kilometers per hour in some parts of western Manitoba, passed through on Sunday, June 16th. Extensive tree damage was reported in many parts of southwestern Manitoba, including Nipawa. As bad as it may have seemed here, other locations, including CFB Shiloh and Glenborough, reported golf bar sized hail and even spotted funnel clouds, though there were no confirmation of touchdown. <coughs> And Nipua Minor Ball is hosting baseball regionals. The local ball diamonds are going to be packed this weekend, weather permitting of course, as Nipua Minor Ball is set to host of the 2024 Midwest Regionals. There will be eight teams from the U11 division and four from the U13 category participating in these concurrent tournaments. For U11, there are two teams from Nipua as well as clubs from Rivers, Bertle, Hamiota, Minidosa, Russell and San Lazar. For the U13, Two Nipua based clubs along with Minidosa and Russell will compete. The weekend round robin schedule for the Nipua baseball team is as follows. Friday, June 21st, Nipua under U11 number one versus Nipua number two. U11 13 number two versus Minidosa. Oh, sorry, the first one is at 1 p.m. on Diamond Two, the second 3 p.m. on Diamond Four. Nipua under 13 number one versus Russell, 6 p.m. at Diamond Four. Saturday, June 22nd, Nipua U11 number two versus Bertle at 9.30 on Diamond Two. Nipua U13 number one versus Minidosa, 9.13 at Diamond Four. Nipua U11 number one versus Rivers, 12 p.m. at Diamond Two. Nipua U13 number two versus Russell, 12.30 p.m. at Diamond Four. Nipua U11 number two versus Rivers, 3 p.m. at Diamond Six. U13 versus Nipua U13, U13 1 versus Nipua U13 2, 3 p.m. at Diamond Four. And Nipua U11 number one versus Bertle, 6.30 at Diamond Six. As for the tournament finals, the U11 regional, regional championship will take place on Sunday, June 23rd at 2 p.m. on Diamond Two. The U13 regional fi fi final, meanwhile, will be at 4.30 p.m. on Diamond Four. Keep in mind that all these times could be altered due to weather conditions. Good luck to all the teams, and remember, it's just a game and have fun out there. And continuing with sports, Nipua Cubs' undefeated streak hits four games by Owen Devereaux. The Nipua Cubs are inching closer and closer to top spot in the Santa Clara Baseball League, riding the momentum of a recent four-game unbeaten stretch. The Cubs' latest success was a 4-3 home win over the Austin A's on Friday, June 14th. Going into the top of the seventh and final inning of this matchup, the Cubs had put together a 4-0 lead. Austin, however, was able to get the bats going late, scoring three and making the end of the evening a bit more dramatic. Starting pitcher Garrett Rempel, however, was able to hold on for his third win of the season. Over seven full innings, he surrendered just four hits while registering ten strikeouts. As for the offensive efforts, Taylor Fletcher batted in three runs over the course of the game, while teammate Cody Pazwisti even went two for three at the plate. Nipoa was scheduled to return to the Diamond for a rare Monday night game on June 17th against the Minidosa Mavericks, 1-8-0. Mother Nature, however, had other plans as rain in the region forced a postponement. No make-up date for this game was confirmed before the Banner and Press publication deadline. And around the Santa Clara Baseball League, the Portage Padres drowned the Plumas Pirates 7-4 on Monday, June 17th to move to 6-1-1 on the season in the Santa Clara Baseball League. The Pirates slide back to 5-3 and, and sit 1.5 games back of the league-leading Padres. Elsewhere around the league, the Austin A's drowned the Carbor Car Carberry Royals 5-4 in a rain-shortened five-inning game to pick up their fourth win of the year and now sit at 4-4. Four Carberry falls to 3-6 and six on their 2024 campaign. 
and Spring Fever Races 2024 results. And pictured competition from across the province gathered in Nipua on Saturday, June 8th for Spring Fever Races. This event, held at the High Life Back 40 bike trail, was a qualifier for the Manitoba Summer Games. The Spring Fever Races 2024 was held on Saturday, June 8th at the High Life Back 40 bike trail in Nipua. This event was an official qualifying com competition for the Manitoba Summer Games, scheduled for August 11th to 17th in Dauphin. The top five finishers in each Aiden skill category were U U15 Manitoba Games qualifier male, Tavin Sheepers, time of 21.49, Nevin Hawanek, time 21.49.8, Jackson Byers, 23.57.6, Ma Max Bundock, 24.32.9, and Nicholas Nazer, 25.20. U15 qualifier female, Charlotte Claussen, 26.30.1, Sophie Saquette, 29.17.2, and Bree Farmer, 33.54.7. U13 qualifier male, Jordy Lowen, 19.6.9, Graham Zagawalski, 19.30.9, Dexton Sheepers, 2032.4, Timothy Kruvaziak, time 21.28.0, Cyrus Thompson, 21.47.0. U13 qualifier female, Lane Burley, 21.34.2, Larissa Benson, 21.55.4, and Claire Farmer, 24.08. Harriet Hawthorne, 25.31.1, and Charlotte Jacket, 27.55.9. Sport male 15 plus and sport female 15 plus. Aubrey Allen, 38.46.4. Lev Fricoda, 39.46.8. Marcus Hubner, 40.11.7. Brent Burley, 41.044. And Joseph Tabin, 42.32. Pinja Hyrutanen, 45.25.9. Vanessa Peters, 52.30.4. And Daniela Kolhankova, 1. 1021.6. Expert female plus 15 plus and expert male 15 plus. John Peter Peters, 1 hour 217.0. Brett Zakowski, 1 Graham Weeb, 1 one And Ollie Haitane Hachandnan, 1 Ken Stojak, 1 Comp female 15 plus and comp male 15 plus. Peter Cares 54582. Gordon Darling 56414. Jerry Skopluck 1176. Jason Lowen 1336. And James Benson 109035. <coughs> And you can afford your own home. Nipua Habitat for Humanity hosts Q&A session by Owen Devereaux. Despite the fact they've been in existence for almost five decades, there's still an alarming amount of people who don't really know what Habitat for Humanity is all about. Fortunately, the Nipua chapter of Habitat recently held an information session to shine a light upon some of that apparent mystery which still surrounds the nonprofit group. Partnership Housing. About a dozen people gathered at the United Church in Nipua on Monday, June 18th to learn about the organization and requirements for participation within the program. One of the more consistent falsehoods about Habitat for Humanity is that they are giving a ho home house to the selected family. That is simply not true. Amanda Nottingale, who led the meeting on behalf of the local Habitat Committee, told the Banner and Press that it's a proper home ownership. Sometimes there is a m misconception about what being a Habitat for Humanity family really means. It's not a free house. It is purchasing and agreeing to a mortgage, and that mortgage is just really give a huge benefit to a family to get them into a situation where they can build equity, said Nottingale. At its core, Habitat partners with a selected family whose total income ranges between $32,000 and $84,000. The house is then built through the Habitat program to suit the needs of that particular family and sold to them at fair market value. There is no down payment required and the monthly mortgage that is paid is always 27% of the family's gross income. Another important part of the deal is that there is no interest on the mortgage payments, like there would be if you purchase a home through the bank or credit union. 
at its simplest terms, you are still buying that home just like everyone else. This is a partnership. We want to make sure that the family that is chosen will be set for success, said Nottingale. And what is sweat equity? There are other requirements for a family to partner with Habitat for Humanity, one of which is sweat equity. But don't worry about the term because it's not nearly as daunting as it may sound, Naughton Gale explains, that all sweat equity is, at its core, is giving back locally in some ways. Families are required to put in 500 hours of sweat equity, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's at the house building it. That's improving our community, helping out other places. The deadline to apply for partnership is July 19th. For any people who were not able to attend the meeting, they can contact Amanda at the Salvation Army Thrift Store or at info at nipwa.habitat.mb.ca. An application meeting is required with families to explain the process. Nottingale notes that it is worth it for those hoping to establish their family's future in a positive way. And music on the porch. Nipua's wicked whiplash of weather on the evening of Wednesday, June 12, cleared up just in time to provide clear, sunny skies for the first of three Music on the Porch events put on by Blair and Kim Chapman, who are pictured above. The Margaret Lawrence home was the chosen venue for the evening, and the hymns were welcomed as a special guest. Performances were given from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m., with all welcome to bring a lawn chair and enjoy the evening, as well as to make a donation towards the Little Valley Jamboree of Rain, music could be moved, an event of rain, music could be moved inside the Margaret Lawrence home. <coughs> Creating a night for people to remember, the art of Katie Mem Martin to be showcased at the 2024 Gold Thread Gala. And pictured, the artwork of Katie Martin, pictured above, will be showcased at the Gold Thread Gala in Wasagamine on Friday, July 5th by Owen Devereaux. An exhibition and auction of the works of Nipo artist Katie Martin will be a centerpiece of the 2024 Gold Thread Gala in Wasagami, scheduled for Friday, July 5th at 6 p.m. at Danceland in Clear Lake. The gala will feature 10 large oil paintings, created especially for the event. It will also include music from the artist Zach Weston and delicious food catered by the Lake House. As for the paintings themselves, Martin said the concept behind most of this specific work revolves around landscapes and wildlife. She noted that theme was very much on purpose to try and capture the natural beauty of Clear Lake country. I wanted to create an art viewing and buying experience that was different from what people are used to and I also wanted to get some exposure in the Wasagaming area. I created a collection of 10 large oil paintings of the breathtaking views of Riding Mountain National Park over this past winter and I got to work planning the gala in Martin. My hope is that people can come and view and bid on original paintings of the area. While Martin has had her art previously displayed in a variety of exhibitions, the Gold Thread Gala, for her, feels a little bit more distinct. Every exhibition is different, having their own challenges. But this one is different because I'm orchestrating the whole event and not just creating paintings to sell. I'm creating a night for people to remember, Martin emphasized. I've also teamed up with the local nonprofit Riding Mountain Biosphere Reserve, and we will be raising some money for this wonderful organization at the event. I think if we can make buying authentic art fun and exciting, all while using the platform to raise funds and awareness for a good cause, then we are winning all around. Tickets are $65 and will only be sold until June 21st. The tickets can be purchased online by visiting www.katymartinartist.com. And that concludes the issue for the Nipua Banner and Press for Friday, June 21st. I hope you enjoyed.